Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. Can AI help us become a less biased version of ourselves? We'll discuss this and more with Dr. Tomas on today's episode. And now, your host, Ben Taylor. Tomas, thanks for being on our podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Ben. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I how do you pronounce your last name Maybe for the audience? Well, you know, it's one of those things that uh, there are probably different schools of pronunciations because the first part, Chamorro, is originally Italian, but it's spelled and pronounced in a Spanish way, so Chamorro. And the second part is Premujic. Uh, contrary to popular belief, it doesn't mean before music, pre-music, but it means Pervi Mujic, the first husband, which I am not. There have been husbands before me in human civilization. So I wanted to clarify that to begin with. Wow. That, that's a pretty amazing last name compared to Taylor. I, I think my is <laughs> so close and that's it. Well, that's why you make up for it with your behavior and ideas and your brilliant mind, uh, Ben, whereas uh, I sort of uh, slowly work my way down from the impactfulness of my name. So, Tomas, tell me about Deeper Signals and what you guys are doing over there. Our fundamental assumption is that most of the problems that organizations have could be solved if they understood their people better and if people understood themselves better. So uh, our goal is to really, really provide people with a better understanding of themselves and others. And we combine behavioral science, technology, and AI to enable this. And, you know, a lot of the people that have gone through our tools and assessments are not doing it to change careers, but rather to understand how they can be more effective at what they are doing. Okay. And I, I want to make sure our listeners appreciate this. So historically, some of these assessments that people have to go through are terrible. They're 60 minutes, an hour and a half, and it's a terrible candidate experience. So you said five minutes. That That's really, really fast. How are you guys able to achieve that type of candidate experience and still get useful hooks and information out of yep. it? Yes, yeah, so it's true. You know, I mean, and, and the reason why historically assessments have been so long is because it didn't have either so much data in the background or um, the analytics tools to actually uh, cut to the chase and identify the single most predictive signals for a given attribute, competency or quality. We have a lot of data on each of the questions, on each of the exercises. And with that, we can really streamline and make things a lot, a lot shorter. Um, you know, it is also true that in the past, the candidate experience was not important. If you wanted a job, you'd have to sit through hours of this. And if you don't get a job, you don't hear from us again. And, you know, you're kind of discardable and disposable. Today, organizations are very interested in providing people with a good candidate experience, even if they're not hired. Therefore, they need to provide them with feedback. So, you know, I think if you, Ben, applied for a job at my company and you don't get it, you would still benefit from knowing why you didn't get it, where you should go, and how you can be better next time. And there are no excuses for not doing that today um, because technology enables you to provide automated, personalized feedback at scale. And how do you see AI playing a role in in this platform compared to what was available 10, 20, 30 years ago. So what is AI able to do that you would not be able to do previously? Well, you know, so I think um, AI definitely enables you to um, make the tools shorter, fine tune the algorithms. Um, that is almost entirely dependent on how good the performance data are that we can feed. So, you know, um, our clients and organizations would kind of uh, add or provide performance data um, of different types. And then even if people go through the same kind of protocol or assessment, which is always five minutes, um, you can customize the algorithms to make them more predictive or focus on the things that really, really matter. That's really the main contribution of 
AI in terms of you know machine learning algorithms to score um, the answers or responses or interactions with our tools. If you or I gave a talk at SciUp on consciousness as a competency, would that be well received? Nobody will be in the room, assuming there is a room and it's not virtual. And uh, for sure, the people, if one or two people attend, they might be in the wrong event or, you know, be too polite to leave. They were there for another reason. I mean, zero participants. Is that a kind of a taboo topic? Have people tried to bring that up in psychology or geeked out about it? I think it's as alien to IO psychology as maybe a kind of um, um, wall paint and raw materials and uh, perhaps a history of the Venetian Empire. They would not understand why it's even there, even though, you know, we're probably all the people there have consciousness or are capable of conscious processes. Is lying useful in the workplace? Canopy. Absolutely. Yeah. Lying is useful and essential in any area of life. I mean, if you really want to go through life telling the truth 100% of the time, uh, you're going to struggle, whatever you want to do, and you're going to make a lot of enemies and you're going to violate uh, basic uh, uh, rules of social etiquette. You're going to upset and hurt people. And uh, I even think that if you are unable to lie to yourself, you're going to have a miserable and depressing existence. So, you know, it's useful to lie to yourself and to others. The better you are at lying to yourself, the less you need to worry about lying to others because you, you believe your own kind of uh, BS. I, I love that. And doesn't this bring up uh, gender inequalities because men are more likely to ignore job requirements and essentially lie? and apply for a job where they don't satisfy them. Uh, maybe yeah. speak to that. I, I know you've written a book on yeah. this very topic. Yeah, here we go. So, you know, conveniently had it here. So um, your listeners, listeners, our listeners, our viewers can see it. So the last book, number 10, is Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and How to Fix It? And it talks a lot about the gender differences in confidence and competence. It's quite interesting because on the one hand, Men lie to themselves more than women do. Women are, on average, on average, more self-critical and honest with themselves, uh, more riddled by self-doubt and more, um, uh, more realistic, really, about their skills and their capabilities, with men being more deluded. But actually, uh, that's probably because male delusion is uh, rewarded and celebrated a lot in most cultures, you know. So as the world becomes more complex, people are less capable at identifying actual talent. So they focus more on style, less on substance. And when you're male and you are deluded or self-deceived, people will attribute those behaviors and those delusions to actual talent and potential. Whereas if female display a surplus, if women display a surplus of confidence and even arrogance, uh, they're punished for it and, you know, seen as pathologically ambitious. And, you know, the irony is that so much of uh, gender focus or centric advice is actually focused on making women as deluded, overconfident as men, as opposed to lowering men's confidence so that it aligns with their actual ability, you know? Um, as if the solution to a world run by overconfident fools was to make the other half of the people overconfident too. You know, we have something wrong there, and that's basically the subject of my book. Yeah, I, I love this topic because it kind of paints a negative light on the emotional side of society and humans. I wish we were less emotional. I wish, we're, wish we were all more rational. But it's the emotion that kind of leads to creativity, innovation, and discovery, right? So you can't, you can't rob humans of their emotions, because where would we be without them? So I, I feel like every four years, the emotions become top of mind that we hate human emotions, we hate overreactions, tribalism, yeah. and these things, but they're core to humanity. Exactly. They're core. And then at the same time, you know, someone once says, Reality is that which does not go away because you stop thinking about it, you know. So if your emotions are mainly self-protection or um, self-enhancing cathartic mechanisms to protect your self-esteem, 
and you're just distorting reality in favor of your own existing biases and self-beliefs, uh, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> you're going to have trouble. So I think you can be aware of your emotions and try to be a less biased version of yourself. I think that should be you know, the main goal. How can you be a less biased version of yourself? And for sure, not by speaking to people who only agree with you, not by living in your own filter bubble, and not by dismissing anyone who has a different opinion from you. I mean, right now, yesterday, and watching the debate, to be honest, CNN or Fox doesn't make a difference. They're like both just so partisan and emotional and very non-informative because they're just campaigning. Yeah. Can we blame algorithms for that? Where algorithms are, they're intentionally siloing you. I'm going to see a feed that agrees with my political views where there's a polarization that's accelerated. Is, is yeah, that so I think true? It might be that algorithms are like, you know, gasoline to the fire and the fire was there and it kind of makes it worse. That's probably the worst case scenario. At the same time, you know, uh, you can't blame social media or Facebook for the filter bubble. You have to blame humans. We love the filter bubble. Um, you know, YouTube, actually, which probably has the most effective and accurate recommendation engine because you watch something and then immediately you have to switch and watch something else, goes outside the filter bubble, I think. right? It shows me a lot of things that I hate to love watching or love to hate watch, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so you can have a mix of both and consume content outside of uh, your, you know, kind of uh, main core beliefs and interests. But yeah, I, I, I think algorithms and social media and the way that it has been designed cater to our, um, to our uh, preference for living inside a bubble. Yeah. And so we are not genetically pre-wired to talk to people who are different and opposite to us, even if today... There is a benefit for that because that's how you can get diverse and inclusive teams and organizations that leverage the power of collective thinking, you know. But this is like something that happened in the last second of evolution. If evolution is, you know, 100 years old. Yeah, this uh, this is fascinating because it reminds me of the Netflix show, The Social Dilemma, where humans did not evolve to have 100,000 humans stuck in a phone liking your Twitter feed or liking your post all day. Yeah. And exactly. does that somehow hack the human's need for positive affirmation or the human's need for social acceptance, but on a, a scale that we never evolved to accept? Yeah, exactly. So on the one hand, you know, these are tools and uh, nudging technologies that have been built around our fundamental needs, you know, and you can't argue that um, we have you know, biologically or physiologically change. And now we have a different motivational system, a different brain, you know, I mean, we're the same in essence. So if anything, you know, I guess the equivalent would be uh, humans evolved to consume as many calories as possible. So anything that was highly caloric and sugar was scarce in the past and would be prioritized. And now you have the whole junk food and fast food industry that exploits that and makes us fat, you know? So I think the social dilemma and nudging for likes or retweets or followers is the equivalent of fast food to our motivational system of, you know, people want validation, they want status, they want to bond with others. And so you can't blame social media or Zuckerberg or uh, Twitter for creating this. I mean, you know, they're just exploiting our motivational uh, kind of a uh, reward circuits. Can humans ever fix these biases in the workplace? Or is this a, is it a chronic illness we'll never cure our, cure ourselves of? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And I think, you know, so long as you have humans on earth or in any environment, um, there will always be bias. There will always be, you know, stereotypes, prejudice, because the same incredible tools that make our brains and minds so powerful, the ability to extrapolate, draw conclusions, generalize, um, have a dark side. And that dark side is to, um, you know, be so 
relentlessly impatient that we don't have time to give people the benefit of the doubt and we can't you know be taught to unlearn certain things like i'm talking to you right now i cannot for a second forgive forget the fact that you are um male white american and all those things you know and so so you'd always have bias but i think that uh, some people are less biased than others and it is a worthy endeavor to try to become a less biased version of ourselves and to try to create culture, systems, and organizations where people act in the most possible rational way. And I do think that uh, technology, data, machines, AI will enhance our ability to be more rational and uh, more thoughtful. Just like if they're misuse, they can have the opposite effect and make us more mindless because uh, you know, if you want to design something that has ingrained or systemic bias within it and you rely on it, uh, you're going to make more, more mistakes. You know, it's going to augment and scale mistakes. But even though I'm not an optimist, I do think that uh, at the end of the day, whatever framework or um, system of thinking you adopt, uh, there's always going to be a reward and positive reinforcement for groups, teams and organizations uh, that are better at interpreting and predicting the world. And if you can't interpret and predict the, predict the world, you cannot uh, manage and influence it so much, you know? So um, the more biases you have in an individual group, team, system, or nation, uh, the more self-defeating that system will be because it will inevitably lose touch with reality and have a more rudimentary understanding of the world. I mean, if you think about it, how we transition from shamanism or um, religion onto science, you know, you can, you can, science is not perfect and you can have objections, but we wouldn't be living so long. We wouldn't have uh, created the things we created. Civilization would look, you know, like a much more um simple and rudimentary place if we hadn't mastered it through science and so that line will continue and sometimes progress is not a straight line but i think we're on the right track and that is going to make for a more intelligent tomorrow and i do think that that is that that will involve humans partnering with ai and vice versa because one without the other is not as strong Tomas, I always get smarter every time I interact with you. I really appreciate your time. We, we've been able to get a lot of really good content, and I'm, I'm really excited to see how this turns out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Always a pleasure. And uh, I hope this uh, turns out fun, useful, and interesting, not just to us, but also someone else. Thank you for having me.